Good day, everyone. Bienvenue à ce seminar and in Anishinaabe Moen, Ani Minigizi Bawagad. Thank you so much for taking time to attend today from wherever you are in the world. I would like to begin by extending a very warm welcome uh, to those who are participating from Indigenous communities from uh, around the world that are joining us today. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that at Libraries and Archives Canada, we hold the stories of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis Nation from across the northern part of Turtle Island, which is now known as Canada. And we recognize that without truth, there can be no reconciliation. I'm Leslie Weir. I'm the Library and Archives of Canada. I am also part of the ICA Forum of National Archivists Steering Committee and I'm the person responsible for the liaison with the Program Commission. I would like to thank all of our colleagues from ICA New Professionals Program for providing us with this forum and bringing us together for what is going to be an incredibly fascinating discussion. This seminar series has been designed to give voice to the international community of of archival and record keeping students and new professionals to provide an opportunity to engage with leaders of the profession. The seminar series brings these two areas of ICA together to create a welcoming, I hope, environment for early career professionals and students to share their work, ideas, and research. The first ICA area, the New Professionals Program, or NPP, supports future leaders in the field of archives and records management. The program supports a cohort of early career professionals within the first five years of their career to work on a project of their choice, to present virtually as part of International Archives Week, meet leaders in the field, receive a mentor for career advice, and attend and present at the International Council on Archives Conference. The program also creates and shares resources for the community and encourages participants to be active ICA members and committed professionals at local and international level, helping to create a network of new professionals all around the globe. The second ICA area, area, ICA area the Forum of National Archivists, is also known as FAN, and it brings together leaders of the National Archives from around the world to develop high-level strategic responses to contemporary archival management challenges. In my role within ICA FAN Steering Committee, I have been privileged to meet and work closely with colleagues from all different regions, cultures, and different areas of expertise. Their wealth of knowledge and experience and willingness to collaborate has been invaluable to me and the Libraries and Archives Canada. So when the MPP organizer reached out and invited us at Libraries and Archives Canada to host this virtual get together, I was thrilled to accept. I'm truly thankful for the opportunity to moderate this third seminar with all of you. This virtual seminar is part of the numerous activities organized in the celebration of MPP's 10th anniversary. What a fantastic milestone. I would like to congratulate all the colleagues who've worked throughout the years to ensure the success of the program and of the new professionals. In moderating today's exchanges, I will try my best to ensure a seamless, enjoyable experience for all, as was the case, I have to say, in the first two seminars moderated by our colleagues at the UK National Archives and the National Archives of Australia. Today's seminar, will be archival education, training, and research. Over the next two hours, we will listen to our colleagues, students, new professionals, reflect on various topics, including the available pathways to becoming an archivist, their education and training, some of the exciting research undertaken as part of their jobs or studies. We will also have an opportunity to consider how archivists from different parts of the world are trained, what gaps there are between education, training, and practice, and maybe how to think about filling those gaps. 
Having worked in the information science field for many years, I am really excited to hear from our young peers, the creativity, the energy, the fresh perspectives they bring to the table. Take me back to when I was a student and a young professional, it might be a few years ago. As the younger generation of archivists take on their roles and mature into them, let's also keep in mind those that will soon uh, be joining our ranks or are interested in exploring the world of archives. I believe it's in our collective interest to fully support and find ways to improve the experience for those joining our wonderful profession. After each presentation, there will be a Q&A, which I suspect will bring out many interesting conversations. So as you're listening, get your questions, uh, be ready. And without further ado, let me introduce today's first speaker. We are going to begin with Pilar Fernandez Pedriera, Pedriera, who will talk to us about building an inclusive archival profession. Over to you, Pilar. Hello, let me. Uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, from Georgia, in a small town in the, in the so called Spain Empty for the celebration of the Congress of Archivists of this nation, Castile and Leon. Um, my question is, I don't know if you can see the slides or something. So, thank you. Um, first time today, a new professional program for this opportunity to briefly share about an often unknown topic, the inclusion of archivists with disabilities in our profession. Uh, next slide, please. Every day, a wide range of users visit our archives. They are from different ethnic, religious, geographical, social, cultural, and educational backgrounds, as well as people with disabilities. And every day we aim to provide the best services to all of them, regardless of their differences. As professionals, we have acquired the necessary skills to fulfill this mission. Next slide, please. The International Day of Disability, celebrated on the 3rd of December, serves to highlight the diversity of physical and cognitive abilities. The most visible disability such as well you, autism, blindness, and so forth, are often the practices on posters and social media. It is precisely the visibility that helps raise awareness and, accept and acceptance of this condition. However, those disabilities are less apparent, such as deafness, and less likely to be noted. Next slide, please. In the context of archive, accessibility is commonly referred to the physical access to the premises, ramps, lifts, bright shining, and also to the service provided to users. We have therefore adapted and improved the design of our content, our, our consultation tool, and our web pages to comply with the web content accessibility guidelines. However, we really stop to think about the diversity among our own colleagues. Next slide, please. For instance, there's a lack of awareness of the difficulty in assessing the field when it comes to disability. There's a, there, there are still certain prejudices when having people with disabilities. Some people falsely believe that a worker with a disability will not be able to perform autonomously many tasks without help. But even worse, that this type of worker are disabled or ill person, unable to perform their duty due to health or physical barrier. In this regard, it may be interesting to change the perspective, putting the focus on what the people, what the, these people can do. It is, a, it is simple a matter of identifying the need 
of the worker and the evolution, based on social circumstances and the person own circumstances, as well as the job to which they are part, so that they may can be adapted to them. Next slide, please. I will use my own case as an example. I am a deaf person, and my employer has taken into account the fact I cannot take any external calls. Therefore, they have provided the option of instant messaging, WhatsApp, for example, and Microsoft Teams for video call or Zoom or whatever. So uh, they enable subtitles that they make, it, they make it easier for me to follow the conversation. Similarly, they have been told for alarm in the work area and warehouse, which are not only audible, but also luminous. In addition, the integration work of my colleague is not worth it. They are always ready to collaborate if, for communication reasons, I am unable to attend to, to the needs of a service, especially phone call. This help uh, foster confidence in the performance of my duty and create a sense of security in my working environment without my situation coming in the way of my daily archival work or that of the rest of the team. That is why I would like to raise awareness of the need to facilitate access to the archival field for people with disability. One of the safer and also least no way to do is through the selection processes from the public administration job. Make it likely. The Spanish legislation, specifically the basic statute of public employees acts, establish a series of guidelines to be taken into account in order to facilitate access to different work for this group. For example, a quarter of 7% of the vacancies of in public jobs must be reserved for people with disability provided that they pass the selection process. This means that out of every 20 vacancies, one must be allocated to this group. It is also mentioned that this group has the right to retain the core of the first section as long as it's not lower than the 60% of the higher core in total in the next process. Furthermore, accommodation for the exam are provided. This point is often the most unknown and the most subjective, as it is adjusted to the specific needs of the candidate. The selection board typically receives a list of the criteria for accommodation to ensure equality of condition in the selection process, with the aim of removing any potential obstacle to candidates taking the exam. This is established by our current legislation. The public authority within the scope of their respective, respective competence shall consider equal treatment and non-discrimination in the selection processes and in the training of their person. Next slide, please. It is the responsibility, it is the responsibility of the public administration to ensure that these working conditions are currently met. And they are not always guaranteed in private companies, despite enjoying economic support in the form of public subsidy in our country. Paradoxic paradoxically, some of the subsidies companies, precisely because of the advantage they obtain by employing people from this group, turn them into cheap labor which is, economically, which is economically profitable due to the, due to the condition. Next slide, please. It is often overlooked that people with disability also want and deserve a decent job. Rather than focusing on what makes them different, it will, more, it will be more beneficial to focus on their ability. 
As a part of the, the group of people, it is my objective through this talk to make this reality visible, audible, and tangible. Fortunately, changes are already beginning to be seen. I have now come to the end of this talk. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate me to contact me by email, my email or social media. And I think, and I think it's time for a round of questions with Leslie Well. So I'm all here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pilar. I loved your slides. Like you had me right at the first one. And it was just wonderful for you to share your personal experience with us. Uh, and it is so important that um, people with a wide range of disabilities can move into archives as a profession. Are there other improvements that you think could be made that we could make as a profession or as employers that would make being an archivist more accessible um, to people with disabilities? Um, first and foremost, it is completely necessary to give visibility to the reality. Just as here with this little talk, I make people aware that this collection can be a true value in the profession because of how much they can contribute beyond their value. Second, and to create safe work environment when they can carry out their tasks with security and confidence that they are equally valid in the archives. And the third is to create awareness among archivist colleagues that empathy is so important, not only with the user who go to the archive to consult the documentation and the file, but with their own workmen and collaboration to provide good attention and service to the citizen and the, and the archive itself. And I think with the role you are in, um, you would recommend that um, persons with disabilities do look at becoming archivists. And um, why would you recommend um, access to public services uh, as an archivist uh, to persons with disabilities? From my own experience, I can say that one of the main reasons why I decided to join the public administration is the guarantee of knowing that I have a job with dignity. That is not to feel a ship labor for, that they only want me for the benefits, but also to be able to contribute as a professional archivist and to know that the public salary reflects the work that is carried out in the working condition with dignity. And especially with that, that the identity that you can work on what you are passionate about without fear or being fired, especially due to the limitation one has. Creating job stability that allows you to build a day-to-day -day life outside work that is already difficult for so many people with disabilities. I highly recommend that if there's the possibility in your country of giving this uh, this is paid to this group. You will not only be given a good job in a good condition, but also a peace of mind that is not easily found in the working market. If normal people can they find a job with the same condition today, <laughs> it's just so hard to imagine the collective because there are usually many prejudices before even having a job interview. And sometimes they are not even given the opportunity because of that. Yes, that's, it's terrible when people are screened out without even having an opportunity to demonstrate that uh, they could excel at something and, and should have fair access to be considered for, those, for these important roles. So what type of complementary training should an archival professional with a disability have that might facilitate or help them with their access to the profession? Mm, there really wouldn't be much need for a specific training for people with disabilities. Of course, the same training as any other archivist is usually recommended. University degree, master degree, a specific archival courses. 
Um, what I do encourage these people is to not be afraid of showing learning difficulties in courses. For example, requesting adaptation according to the limitation of each one, and especially during the selection processes for the public administration, if there works. It is also true that each selection board is different, that the willingness to collaborate might be shown at all times, so that equal opportunities in the process are smooth. Most of the time, it's a lot of empathy. There's a lot of empathy and a willingness to help people so that so that they can show their full potential during the test in the Spanish case. To demonstrate that they can be good archiving and have a good attachment to the archival world. Well, Pilar, I really want to thank you. I want to thank you for your presentation. I want to thank you for your insights and and. Um, for sharing your personal story with us, because that that make you know it helps people connect and and uh, create that empathetic relationship. And uh, I I I think it was great to be able to look at the importance of making every workplace an inclusive workplace. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for you to. To give me the chance to talk about this topic. Um, I hope that everyone is, um, can give this chance to their own realities in their own country to this situation. And keep in mind Pillar's offer. She's provided her email and she's happy to connect with people. Now, I would like to introduce our next session. So we have Brittany Long and Lydia Schreimer from Libraries and Archives Canada, and uh, they will present on Alternative Pathways, Perspectives on Diverse Education and Training to Become an Archivist. So I'm going to pass things over to you, Brittany and Lydia. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, and thank you particularly to the ICAC Professional Program and the Forum of National Archivists as well for giving us the opportunity to present today. Um, could you bring up the slides, please, Miguel? Thank you so much. Uh, so as Leslie said, I'm Lydia Schreimer and I'm here with my colleague, Brittany Long today. We're both archivists on the declassification team at LAC. That's the short form for Library and Archives Canada. And neither of us actually have any formal training in archival science. And in fact, when we were at university in our undergraduate and in our graduate degrees, neither of us actually knew that that was a viable career option for us. So despite the fact that my alma mater and wide variety of Canadian universities and colleges have programs in archival science and records and information management, we didn't hear about the program. Still, and very fortunately, we've both now ended up working at LAC, and we find that our diverse educational backgrounds have actually proven to be an asset in our current day-to-day -day work as archivists. So today, um, we'll be speaking to you about the work that we do at LAC, um, but mainly about the education uh, and training backgrounds that um, got us to where we are today. Our goal is to provide our own personal stories as a sort of case study to show how diverse educational pathways combined with continued investment into on-the-job training and mentorship um, can prove valuable in the archival world. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what do we do on the day to day? Um, well, the work that we do as archivists on the declassification team is a bit different um, than what you might think of normally when you hear the word archivist, um, rather than the more standard archival tasks of acquisition, evaluation, description, disposition, preservation, uh, and so on. The archivists, our team, also help to facilitate access to archival material. Um, however, we do that by specifically reviewing um, material for declassification. So our team is part of the Access to Information and Privacy branch, or the ATIP branch, as it's 
locally known here. And this is the branch at LAC that's responsible for handling access or freedom of information requests. Now, requests for information, which include things like classified information, classified records, otherwise sensitive records, this often slows down the review process and in turn results in extended wait times for the client who's requested these records because specifically LAC may need to consult with the originating department. And this is the case because while LAC holds historical archival government documents, LAC does not have the legal authority to declassify the documents it holds in its collection. Of course, anything we've created, we can declassify, um, but for documents that come from another government department, that originating department retains the legal authority over that classification status. So if we want to declassify anything, we need to get the originating department to agree. Now, in an effort to mitigate some of these delays that are commonly experienced during the ATIP request process, the declassification team proactively reviews documents before they're subject to an ATIP request. And in doing that, our work consists of three main stages. So first of all, we immerse ourselves in the collection of, of the government archives through things like finding aids, through our records management database, specifically in order to identify some potential cases for declassification. Once we've identified some, we perform a higher level check of the physical material, the actual records themselves, just to ensure that A, there is actually classified material in those records and that the records actually seem suitable for review. Now, once we've done that and provided it passes, we move to a closer analysis of the material itself. And the goal there is to write a report for the originating department with our recommendations about its classification status. And usually that's either to declassify it or to potentially downgrade. Now, this report will discuss a number of relevant factors, things like the age, what the topic is, and the goal here is so that the originating department can make a well-informed decision without necessarily having to send someone to come to LAC in person and physically consult those records to make the decision themselves. So in a nutshell, as archivists working in declassification, we spend most of our time reading and analyzing the actual documents in our collection and then also thinking about what their disclosure might mean for current Canadian interests and national security, as opposed to what it meant when they were originally written. Next slide, please. So how did we end up doing this work? Um, how did we gain the competencies and qualifications necessary? Um, well, both Lydia and myself took fairly different paths with our education. Um, which we will now get into. Um, so my educational background is in history, um, which I find complements archival work rather nicely. Um, so I received a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of New Brunswick, um, where I focused on modern European history um, with an emphasis on modern and contemporary Germany, as well as the history of gender and sexuality. Um, at that time, my research largely focused on gender and sexuality within the context of the Third Reich and Cold War Germany, um, which provided interesting context for the work I do today. Um, Complementing this, I also worked as a research assistant for one of my professors who was looking at the Herero and Nama genocide in Namibia, um, which was at the time known as German Southwest Africa in, among Western countries. Um, I then went on to do my master's degree in history at Carleton University, um, where I took my experience studying women and genocide to examine female perpetrators of the Holocaust, um, more specifically female concentration camp guards and how they were perceived within public memory from the late 1940s up until 2018. Um, my master's thesis required that I travel to national archives um, in different countries. So I traveled to the National Archives in London, as well as the Bundesarchiv in Berlin, um, to conduct research. Um, so in those archives, I looked at trial documents um, from various post-war trials. Um, I looked at German concentration camp records, as well as different records regarding um, policy. 
Um, this not only allowed for the opportunity to research in other federal archives, um, but provided knowledge on the proper handling of archival material, uh, which was an essential skill in the day-to-day -day work that I do um, currently. In addition to researching at different federal institutions abroad, I also was able to gain experience researching at my own national archive um, here at LAC. Um, and so that was for a course on decolonizing the Royal Society of Canada, um, where we actually co-authored a chapter in an edited volume called Royally Wronged, the Royal Society of Canada and Indigenous Peoples. Now, throughout all of this, um, I realized how valuable our archives are for preserving histories um, like those of the Holocaust and of Canadian colonization, um, which are important to be told. Um, I also gained experience as a client in archives, which has brought me a more nuanced understanding of the difficulties in accessing public records, um, which are faced by clients of archives all around the world. Um, so this, this gave me a deep personal understanding of the value and need for access to records, um, which is helpful not only for someone working as an archivist on the classification, um, but also in more traditional archival roles as well. Um, Practically speaking, of course, my graduate work allowed me to develop more advanced research and analysis skills, which is also something that I use every day. So I did a bachelor's degree in classics at the University of Ottawa. And so this is classics like classical history, ancient Greek, Latin, rather than something like classical languages. And I had an additional focus on Greco-Roman archaeology. In addition to working at U Ottawa's Museum of Classical Antiquities during my degree, I was also very fortunate to be able to participate in an excavation of the Roman court town of Santa Sara um, in Spain. And through both of these, I learned things like artifact handling, conservation, preservation, cataloging, description, and so much more. I then took these skills to a master's degree in classical studies. And while I continued to work at the Museum of Classical Antiquities, I shifted my focus from material culture specifically to the written word, still in its material form, by using papyri as my main source type. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, papyri, papyrus, singular papyrus, or papyri, um, it's an early form of paper made from the papyrus reed, which is super common in the archaeological record, especially in and around Egypt, where there's a great dry climate for its preservation. So using letters and contracts written on these papyri, as well as Roman legal texts, my MA thesis looked at the experiences of women in the later Roman Empire, first as Christianity and then as Islam became significant socio-religious factors in the Mediterranean world. Now moving on from that, I am almost done a joint doctoral degree with the Departments of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa and the Institutes of Medieval Studies and Legal and Constitutional Research at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And I'm focusing there on the intersections of gender, religion, and law. Now for that, my doctoral work is super eclectic and it included everything from Canadian case law to how to produce editions of ancient pathological texts. I brought all of this together in a dissertation which examines what happens to women's legal rights and their agency in times of religious change, specifically through a case study of the guardianship of adult women in the later Roman Empire, again, through these times of, of the rise of Christianity and the rise of Islam. Now, again, my primary source was papyri, mostly contracts, but because of that, I was able to participate in international seminars on digitization and coding for this type of historical textual material. I was able to then gain experience in arrangement and description for international digital collections as well, which is great. So my interest in digital collections preceded the pandemic, thankfully, but the closure of libraries and museums, in my case, in March of 2020, really highlighted the dire need for work in this area, something which, of course, was highlighted in the archival world as well. Um, and so after a number of courses in, in various different coding languages, I participated in a mass digitization initiative in 2021 organized by the American Society of Papyrologists and the International Association of Papyrologists. Now, over the last year, I've been writing up my dissertation, which I 
very much hope to defend this summer. And through the process, I've benefited from the very kind and generous support of my manager and my director, which was absolutely pivotal to being able to juggle thesis writing and my regular day job here at LAC. The many opportunities I had along the way throughout my education have prepared me for archival work in a rather unconventional way. So while I had never heard of the rules for archival description when I came to LAC, I did have experience with things like the Cataloging Cultural Object Standards and the CHID Data Dictionaries, which are the frameworks we use here in Canada for the arrangement and description of museum collections and with similar things in a European context. And so whether, while I'd never done physical records management and I'd never helped process something like access to information, I did have experience in the digital world with things like accessibility, metadata compliance internationally in multiple languages, very handy here in Canada, um, things like that. And of course, while I'd never formally learned how to handle archival material, I had learned how to handle archeological material like bone or pottery or glass and of course, textual material like papyri, and the principles are very similar there. Uh, in hindsight, there are a variety of programs offered by Canadian universities and colleges, um, which could have been and, and could still be um, combined with our existing educational backgrounds. Um, the Association of Canadian Archivists webpage collects a wide array of diplomas, certificates, postgraduate degrees in both English and French. Um, which could lead to future employment or complement existing employment as an archivist. These programs are often grouped under the general category of information management or gestion de l'information um, and are offered by schools or departments of information studies or information management, such as Lydia's alma mater, U Ottawa. Next slide, please. So nevertheless, aside from conducting research in various national archives, I had no education or formal training um, in archival practice. My education provided experience on the client researcher side of the archives, but did not really provide insight into how our, or, uh, archives are organized or functioned from an operational perspective. Um, in 2019, I applied to um, a program we have in Canada called the Federal Student Work Experience Program, um, or known as FSWEP. Um, and I was hired as a student archivist here at Library and Archives Canada. Prior to this job, I had no idea working as an archivist was even an option for me. Um, so I worked as a student archivist for about a year and a half alongside the portfolio archivists for external affairs and transport. Um, and after a small break, um, I was able to be bridged to a full-time position um, at Library and Archives Canada. And so in Canada, bridging in the Canadian government refers to uh, non-advertised appointments of a student who was employed in a, a various um, federal public service programs, such as the FSWA program. So like Brittany, I hadn't really considered the archives as a career option either since I didn't know any archivists with a classics degree. And while they exist, to be sure, they exist in places like the Vatican, which didn't really seem accessible to me as a woman um, and as somebody training in Canada. So additionally, none of my degrees, like none of Brittany's, were an intuitive stepping stone into an archival career in the way that information management, for example, might have been. However, in the fourth year of my PhD, like Brittany, I applied to the FSUP program. And in a happy twist of fate, I was hired as a student archivist um, at LAC in May of 2023. So I held a student contract in the declassification team for a little over four months before I was bridged into my current role. Now, since LAC does require that potential archivists have a master's degree in a related subject, something like history or anthropology or law, which I already had, I was able to be bridged in prior to the completion of my PhD. So my experience um, working as a student archivist here at LEC provided a lot of my foundational archival training. 
I was mentored, again, primarily by the Portfolio Archivist for External Affairs, where I gained experience working with different archival materials, such as textual documents, photographs, as well as oversized material. During this time, I was also able to gain experience with archival arrangement and description. Um, my apologies if you can hear the vacuum in the background. Um, in addition to on-the-job experience, um, students were able to go on various tours to other archives in the region, as well as museums. Um, this allowed me to gain a more well-rounded understanding of how collections are stored, preserved, handled, and organized, um, which was invaluable knowledge to gain um, and influences and supports my work uh, today. Next slide, please, Nicola. So as a student, um, I also had access to a similar variety of on-the-job training and mentorship. Um, I received about two weeks of introductory training at the ATIP branch level, so focused around access specifically. Um, and then throughout my student contract, the LAC-wide student committee also hosted tours, as well as bi-weekly lectures and language training so that we students have the opportunity to familiarize ourselves with the work being done generally at LAC, um, as well as the different opportunities that might be available to us here in the archives. And of course, at the team level, I was mentored by the lovely Brittany and by more senior colleagues in our team. Um, so since becoming full-time archivists, we have been able to obtain further on-the-job training experience and mentorship. We've been able to take courses on um, like effective report writing um, and other courses on Canadian security and intelligence, as well as attend conferences on intelligence history in Canada as it relates to access to government archival records. Um, in addition to courses, we both continue to be mentored by the more senior colleagues on our team. And importantly, um, Canada has two official languages, French and English, um, which means that the records we work with, as well as the people that we work with, require we have a knowledge of both languages. Um, so we've both been fortunate enough to be able to receive on-the-job French training, um, which is essential to our work as archivists in Canada. Um, and so this combination of on-the-job training and education have really brought a unique perspective um, to modern archival work. Next slide, please. So having said all that, the work that we do is an amazing teacher itself. Since we were both hired through the FSWEP program as students, we were very lucky to be able to learn on the job from existing archivists while experiencing real day-to-day -day operations in our respective teams. And that, that was absolutely the best possible training we could have asked for. Now, during our, our daily tasks, they're somewhat different than perhaps somebody who's working in a more traditional archival position, but we continue to have amazing opportunities to immerse ourselves in the collection, to learn about and understand it uniquely from an angle of access and national security, and to understand the collection's organizational structure, its nuances, to gain firsthand experience with the work products of other archivists, and so much more. And at the same time, I'm personally able to integrate my own knowledge of things like Canadian case law and my research abilities into my daily work. All of this um, while applying what we've learned in our, our degrees of the need for public access to records in order to write reliable, accurate, and ethical histories. Coming from historical backgrounds has given us both a deep appreciation of the importance of the documents we work with for the preservation of documentary heritage as an accessible source of knowledge for all. Of course, our individual diversities in education and background can only lead to viable archival careers when combined with ongoing institutional support um, for continuing education and mentorship, um, something which we are both very grateful that is offered to us at Library and Archives Canada. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, I've learned a lot about Brittany and Lydia, I don't know about the rest of you. So this was super uh, educational for me. Uh, I certainly do know that we have uh, archivists that come from many, many different backgrounds, some of which have uh, training in archival sciences and, and then have a wide range of other backgrounds. And, you know, um, I'm kind of interested in following up on that whole idea 
and about how you feel that diverse educational backgrounds are an asset to archival roles. So would you like to explore that question just a little bit? Absolutely, I'll take that one on. Um, I think diversity of all kinds is absolutely pivotal um, in both creating and maintaining an archive that, that serves all Canadians. And education plays into that, of course. Um, so diversity in education means that we have archivists here who bring a wide variety of experiences and insights to the table so that when we're faced with new projects or faced with troubleshooting, we have great new ideas that maybe come from different backgrounds. We're able to pull on, on different, um, different people's backgrounds and different people's trainings. And so that, of course, helps us prepare better for the future and helps bring a, a level of, of interdisciplinarity into what is already an inherently very interdisciplinary uh, field. Thank you, Lydia. And so, since you are both new archivists, what do you think that institutions like Libraries and Archives Canada could do to support you even more and other young archivists like you in your careers? Um, well, I think one of the biggest things is, is really the offering of um, on-the-job training, uh, whether it's taking courses or um, the ability to, I've really benefited from the ability to work alongside more senior archivists and to learn from them and their knowledge from working in the field um, and to ask you questions. And I might have new ideas because I'm, you know, more recently out of school. Um, but I also think that events, um, like sponsoring events like the one that we're doing today um, is really beneficial because it gives us the opportunity, um, like I really enjoyed the first presentation and, you know, thinking more about um, diversity and having people uh, with more uh, roles for people with disabilities and different abilities, um, different training. Um, and so I think just like things like this, you can discuss um, as well as, you know, the opportunity for courses and mentorship. I think just like, continuing to foster those things is going to be what's integral, I think. Thank you for that, Brittany. And do you, I mean, you mentioned that neither of you had this on your radar. Um, and that is, I think, a challenge, not only at Libraries and Archives Canada, but across our country, in other countries. So what can we do, uh, especially institutions, but also I think archivists, how can we promote archival careers to students and lure them in? Yeah, I think an awareness um, at the, the level of, of the student, particularly, is really important. And of course, we are doing that already at LAC to some extent because you lured us both in. Um, but I think there is there is room for, for always more awareness. Um, things like making connections with different universities, diff different post-secondary education um, programs, whether they be the institutions themselves or specific programs can be very, very helpful. Um, for instance, we have had some folks from LAC come in and now speak to the classics program at U Ottawa. Um, and so things like that in the future, I think would be super helpful. And of course, to bounce back to the first presentation of today, I think it's important that we are making sure we're reaching out not to a limited segment of society, but that we're, we're casting our net wide and we're not just getting diverse educational backgrounds, but diversity in, in, in background. Uh, across the board. And just to add to the end of that, Lydia, is I think um, targeting younger students, students maybe in their undergraduate degree, and this is more maybe less for the institutions, but also for the programs that offer um, like information management and archival studies, is targeting like undergraduate students that are in related programs. Um, so we do their masters, they're going to go do like their masters in information management instead of history. Um, and really just we have some slight sound issues with Brittany, targeting but a younger, I... more diverse audience. Uh, there, there was a bit of a delay there. Um, oh, and yeah, yeah but I, I, hopefully we're good now. 
Um, I will say, I, I, I think we need to get them when they're young. So I can't wait until um, when we when we move into our new building. I'm hoping we can connect more with high school students yeah. um, because I think if they knew the possibilities, that might help shape um, their choices in, in what program they'd like to follow. So opportunities there. And do you feel that you've gained kind of the foundational skills necessary to actually take on the challenges with archival roles? And especially you've each described a bit the roles you're in now, but there are many other roles in our organizations. And so how are you feeling? Are you, are you feeling like you've got a good, a good foundation? Uh, yeah, for, for myself, um, I think that the experience I had being able to um, do a lot of research and, and especially having that experience working with different documents on a more client side, um, I feel like the skills that I was able to get in my education, while not specifically targeted towards archives and information management, um, a lot of the skills, they, there are foundational skills like being able to research, organize your thoughts, um, those types of things are, are very applicable and transferable to the archives. And so I feel like I could be put in any position uh, as an archivist, depending on the project or the type of archival work, whether it's like a portfolio archivist or reference. Um, and I think I have enough of the foundational skills um, from my student training and my, my two degrees um, that although there might be a small learning curve, I think the foundation is there to be able to do it well. I would concur. So you don't have anything to add, Lydia? Well, I think obviously that there's a lot of overlap with um, what Brittany has said. There's a lot of transferable skills from, from my education as well. Uh, again, things like working in museums, the, the skills learned there, while not identical, are, are certainly transferable. And the opportunities I've had here to learn as a student and now working on the declassification team, I think would really set me up. Again, there would be, as there always is, when you, when you go to a new job, there would be a, a learning curve. Um, but I would feel confident taking it on um, and confident saying, I, I hope I would do a good job. I'm sure you both would. Now, we're running a minute or two late, so I think we'll wind it up there. But thank you for an incredible presentation and uh, for sharing something of your experience and each of your different pathways that brought you to archives. And uh, I'm thankful to Libraries and Archives Canada. So thank you so very much. And uh, thank you for um, you know, participating today and uh, having the opportunity uh, to uh, encourage students to perhaps think about their paths. So thank you so much, Brittany and Lydia. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce our third session. And um, this is where our uh, presenter, uh, Saman Qureshi, will walk us through the historian and the archivist conundrum. So over to you. Thank you, Leslie. I'm waiting for my slides to come up and I will do. Thank you, Anikula. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Saman Qureshi and I'm currently associated with one of the first architectural archives uh, in India known as SEPT Archives located in the city of Ahmedabad in the state of Gujarat, which is in the western part of the country. I am trained as an architect and further as an architectural historian. Although my path did not originally encompass formal archival training, the past three and a half years have been a rigorous learning and nuanced understanding of an archivist's role. Today, my presentation is going to briefly unfold things that I have learned as I transition to become an archivist, negotiations I undertake as a historian and archivist working in an architectural archive through specific examples along with pros and cons of learning on the job. I would also briefly highlight the aspect of formal training for archivists in the geography I'm based in, while providing perspective of archival discipline in India. 
it is imperative to note that the archival discipline in India is as vast and diverse as the country itself. And my insights are drawn from my own experiences and exposure within this domain. Uh, the presentation aim is to not be definitive, but rather to spark a dialogue and foster discussions uh, that we as a community present here can collectively enrich and build upon. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, it is in. Uh, it would be interesting. Uh, it would be important and interesting to very quickly provide an overview of the collections I work with at the SEPT archives to then contextualize my learnings as an archivist so far. Uh, the SEPT archives collects, preserves, and organizes the history of pedagogy and practice of architecture together with its elite disciplines. The collections are divided largely into four categories, which is professional practitioners that promotes the use of records and that represent the architects of elite practitioners' contributions to the built environment and habitat design across India. Uh, SEPT repository uh, collection preserves an institutional memory of the SEPT University, of which uh, the archives is a part of, of the past six, uh, six decades, along with the oral history and special collection. The archives over the, uh, in a decade after it, its inception in uh, 2013, have digitized and processed over 60,000 records and across 51 sub-collections that include, but are not limited to, as you see on the screen, some of the material, which is drawings, sketches, negatives, photographs, and so on. Next slide, please. Working uh, at the SEPT archives is, is an interesting experience so far for me. My work is posited in a multidisciplinary and rapidly evolving discourse of archiving uh, in the country. Uh, curatorial practices, collection management, and development of pedagogical frameworks to bridge the gap between archives and public engagement. Uh, my current association with SEPT archives allows me to undertake wide-ranging tasks, lead projects, and a small team in the organization on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Articulating my responsibilities and often, is often challenging due to multiple work verticals I engage with regularly. These varied tasks have led me to discover new meanings in the concepts of care, collaboration, negotiation, and sensitization. I regard these four attributes, among many others, as essential for the development as an archivist. Specifically, I consider care for the materials I handle, the new meanings of care that I've uh, uh, realized after working as an archivist for the materials I handle, the collaboration and negotiation with various stakeholders, and continuous sensitization of oneself and those around me to the significance of the work is essential. Next slide, please. The continuous transition in the role also brings a lot of learning and unlearning processes as an archivist that has allowed me to learn new methods of working and to become more receptive to different approaches, even when the best way to accomplish a task is not immediately clear. Often, a lot of tasks one undertakes, undertakes requires intense labor to manage and make sense of vast amounts of information, ensuring its relevance and coherence. Here are some of the interesting pictures of me working and often thinking how did I, how I did end up here. Mostly I was enjoying the work. Uh, often this work is not visible, yet it demands hours of uh, dedicated effort. For me, it is the everydayness of the work that an archivist does that often makes the tasks enjoyable. Although often tedious, it becomes worthwhile when the descriptions are complete, the catalog is finalized, the exhibition is put up, the policy amendment is completed, and so on, which was which was initially a difficult lesson to learn. To an outsider, the tasks may appear repetitive, but at this point, as a, as a reflection, I can term, that, term them as a task requiring iterative processing. Uh, next slide, please. It was important for me to navigate the interdisciplinary conundrum I've often come across between the roles of an architectural historian and an architectural archi archivist that involved a nuanced understanding of both disciplines and the inter interdependencies, as uh, Lydia and uh, other previous my colleagues uh, presented, my peers presented, that uh, I would be echoing them that there are a lot of interdependencies uh, between uh, uh, between different professions, and uh, while we are trying to bridge the gap between an archivist and other professions, that involve the nuanced understanding of both dis both disciplines and their interdependencies. This requires discerning the possibilities of inherent. Uh, in possibilities of inner information in the archival material while, while considering a broader, broader audience. 
I often find myself attracted to certain archival collections more than the others due to the research possibilities that they present. However, over time, I have learned to describe the historical context to all the materials I work with, giving each equal attention. It is important to uh, recognize when to stop and move forward by, while describing the materials to maintain efficiency and focus. And that has come uh, that has come after a lot of iterative and repetitive processes for me. In my experience, noting the provenance and highlighting the interconnectedness of documents within and outside the collection was a bit easier, especially when familiar with the architectural practices and their associated projects and people. Yet the material, when it comes to the archives and is acquired, often reveals much more once described humbling the excited historian in me. At this point, I let the archivist in me take over to arrange the material meticulously and digitize it for further use. There are many such examples, uh, but in the interest of time, I will move on to discuss the negotiations these processes entail. Next slide, please. Um, by negotiations, I'm referring to the ongoing internal uh, deliberations that one engages in while making decisions to ensure the progression and the completion of tasks. Uh, drawing from my practical experience rather than the formal education, I have come to appreciate the significance of both approaches as they yield distinct outcomes. For instance, foundational archival training introduces the student to various uh, formats and types of archives, highlighting the differences between digital and traditional mediums. It also imparts knowledge uh, on the optimal methods for categorizing and organizing materials, as well as the importance of con contents context. My journey to grasp these con concepts was extensive in compassing the adoption of uh, methodologies and metadata standards. While these standards are generally rigid, I have learned that they can be modified to enhance flexibility, scalability, and adaptability, especially when dealing with geographically specific materials. Uh, next slide, please. In the interest of time, I would uh, move on to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this point, it would be important to also reflect on the learning on the job scenario that offers a unique set of advantages and challenges. On the positive side, the opportunity to explore and experiment within a practical framework can lead to solutions and personal gro growth. And because on because uh, this is all. There's always a need to help, uh, need to help, and need of help and assistance with the work-related issues. Leveraging peer support not only aids in problem solving but also helps in exam expanding one's professional network. Um, while learning on the job, uh, one is one realizes that it is important to talk to peers who've already been uh, who have, who are already doing the work in the geography, and it helps expand the network. Um, Utilizing the existing skills for new and unrelated tasks can often lead to surprising and effective outcomes uh, when it comes to material arrangement and when it comes to describing material. While the hands-on approach of learning through reputation and orientation uh, creates a deep understanding of the work that one does. However, there are, there are, there are also a few drawbacks to consider. The process of trial, uh, trial and error while trying out new things uh, uh, can be time consuming and often frustrating. The lack of structured learning from senior colleagues can leave gaps in the knowledge uh, that might be crucial for professional development. Um, ethical dis dilemmas and decision making become more complex when, when one must take risk without a clear precedent. Consistent documentation and quantification of this iterative learning process can be challenging as one needs to do that to be able to um, uh, give the material for appraisals and other things. And the absence of formal training avenues may hinder the acquisition of new skills and the essential for, for career advancement. Overall, while on the job training can be enriching, it requires a proactive and approach uh, and a willingness to navigate its inherent complexities. The another complex bit uh, that I'm approaching to is the geographical scenario of the archival discipline in India, uh, drawn from my own experiences and exposure within this domain, as I said earlier. Next slide, please. The discipline, and this brings me to the uh, to the overall geographical scenario that I'm based in, which is uh, I'm based in the western part of the country, which is India. Um, and the discipline of archiving in India presents a complex landscape marked by historical government dominance. 
Uh, and this this centralized control has often resulted in a lack of formal training uh, of, of archives professional who typically come from backgrounds in history, library sciences, uh, and many more. However, the emergence of private archives in the past decades in the country uh, is a notable development, reflecting a diversification in the uh, in the preservation of historical documents and records. Uh, economic factors pose significant challenges as the Indian economy and minimum wage standards do not favor voluntary work. And uh, this is coming from the exercise that we as uh, NPP cohort 2022 and 2023 did uh, as a part of our project, uh, where we uh, uh, interviewed a lot of people in different geographies to understand the scenario of volunteering in the archives and heritage sector. Um, the, the impacting the 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 absence of voluntary work impacts the involvement of uh, young professionals in the field. Additionally, there's a noticeable absence of senior volunteers and senior professional uh, volunteers, which contrasts with the trend in some other countries, especially UK, uh, which my colleague uh, Rebecca was working on, uh, where retired professionals often contribute to the archival work. Uh, global influences are now currently reshaping the archival landscape in India and introducing new methods and prospects. Uh, the recent establishment of GLAM uh, division in the Ministry of Culture by the Government of India is a positive step suggesting a growing conception, recognition of, of the importance of these cultural repositories and potential for increased funding and support. So there is a bright future ahead and there is a possibility of having more uh, to see more such uh, diversified um, uh, courses around for people who are looking to get into this uh, with different backgrounds, get into the uh, archival discipline. Next slide, please. Uh, in the end, I would also like to uh, very briefly point out the archival training gap that I have uh, that I have been I have I have been facing, and a lot of other colleagues that I know of face. Uh, the archival field in the geography I'm based in is witnessing a significant training gap, particularly in the context of developing a pedagogical framework that addresses the specific needs of the diverse professionals working within it. Uh, individuals from various disciplines uh, currently working within the archives who I've had uh, uh, the privilege of talking to and speaking to for this presentation, such as art history, history, library sciences, anthropology, museum studies, humanities, and journalism. Who brings uh, who who bring a, a wealth of knowledge to the table? Yet they often yet often find a lack of courses in the archival management and record keeping. There surely are some of the courses, but uh, they are they are uh, either outdated or are not currently uh, very easily accessible. This scarcity extend, extends to professional development opportunities as well, leaving a void in a critical area of preserving uh, preserving a collective history and cultural heritage. Uh, the table that I presented here is the work of Ambrose Davis and Ziegler from a paper uh, which, underscore, which underscores the importance of framework that not only contextualizes teaching and learning, but also bridges gap between research and practice, which if transferred to uh, archival to building up archival pedagogy must, would be very helpful to create such uh, unique pedagogical frameworks uh, contextualized to the geography and needs of the need of the art in the geography. Uh, to address these challenges, there's a pressing need for education institutions and professional bodies as well in the geography to develop and offer more comprehensive training programs in archival management. I myself have been working on a pedagogical framework and hopefully we'll be able to present that sometime in the future uh, to, the, to everybody who would be interested. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. Which have my contact information if uh, there's any further uh, correspondence that needs to be done, I'm here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, and this was extremely uh, interesting to hear your experience uh, as an architect and as an architectural historian and uh, how you've uh, moved into being an archivist because that brings quite a unique perspective. It's, it's not your typical archivist's background, although I have to say at Libraries and Archives Canada, we actually have a lot of architectural plans and, and documents that relate to many important buildings in Canada, you could bring an interesting skill set to that. Um, but I'm really curious about what sensitivities you have encountered in this role and how you've adapted your skills from your previous experiences to address them. So uh, that's 
thank you for this question. That's very interesting. I would really like to, uh, you know, uh, speak about that more, which is uh, importantly that, you know, as an historian, uh, you would want to look at the material in a very different way and you would have a certain um, in prior information about that. Uh, especially and in terms of sensitivity when it comes that uh, when a material or a or a practice is coming into the archives and you know a building plan is coming into the archives it's, it's a famous building everybody wants to look at it uh, and if the building that is not very known but very important to the built fabric of the city or the geography uh, it is not known or often are not uh, you know given proper care because everybody wants to see it so that will be taken care of first and i think that is what i've realized that when anything comes into the archives as soon as it enters everything becomes equal uh the the extension of care the the idea of cataloging should not be on the basis of what is more important and what is not. There can be different uh, procedures and there can be different policy pr protocols in terms of what needs to be uh, uh, cataloged first, but needs to have a similar extension of care, similar extension of cataloging, similar extension of the time that is given to the material. So I think that's one very important sensitivity that I've uh, uh, developed over time. Um, uh, regardless of, uh, you know, who the donor is, regardless of who, uh, where it is coming from, the moment it comes to the archives, it is the responsibility of an archivist then to sort of ensure that uh, it is working, the work is happening as per the schedule that we have. And uh, so I think that is something which is still a very tricky thing to do. Uh, but I think that sensitivity is is being developed, is being sort of, uh, uh, is, is there is is aware is that the awareness of this this uh, this thing is there so we try and ensure that this happens but of course there are a lot of other uh, contingencies that comes into play so that is one of course uh, and of course there are a lot of dilemmas in terms of material arrangement uh, of uh, to keep the material arrangement of the material that has come as as from the donor or from not so these are the kind of things that I've learned over time which was which is very simpler thing when one talks about, but becomes very uh, uh, difficult and layered when you actually do them. And the questions then pops up, okay, there, there are two sheets, but there are so many questions I have about these two sheets that I'm handling right now. So these are the kind of things that uh, that sort of comes up. Exactly, exactly. Uh, no two archives are the same and no two donors are the same. And in fact, yeah. no two documents in one archival font are the same. So how do you navigate the challenges of managing collections without prior archival experience? So it, it's actually learning on the job that I, that I discussed. And a lot of it was coming from the idea that uh, now I have this job, I'm here, now I have to do it. So the first step was to self-learn, was to really look out for avenues and for resources. And the first resource, uh, uh, when the moment I joined and the, I walked in was actually an ICA document that I looked at, which was talking about care and handling of arch architectural documents. Um, and then really understanding. So in my, uh, in my, a very uh, in my very immediate context there was uh, there was no architectural archivist or and also this is one of the first architectural archives there is no immediate precedent that i have to reach out to uh, and understand what do you do can i learn from you uh, so i was i was then opening up avenues from uh, beyond the geography and understanding what others are doing uh, how can I learn from them? How can I learn from the open resources that are available around? And what are the what are the uh, learnings that I can contextualize to the needs and the resources that I have? Uh, because of course they are limited. They are of course funding crunches and all of that. So I think the self learning and uh, keep doing it over and over until I have answered some of the very basic questions that I wanted to was one of the first steps that I did. And then reached out to uh, people at ICA, people, and I, I must say that the profession is extremely um, helpful and collaborative and everybody is willing to help when you reach out to them with questions. And I've had uh, uh, and I've had colleagues and peers helping me from across the world to answer, answer questions. And it has been amazing journey so far. Uh, and could not believe that people are so helpful to even answer your naive queries. Uh, and I think that's how I realized that this is a very uh, uh, benevolent profession in that sense. Everybody is willing to help everybody. 
uh, without any prejudice, without any um, sort of uh, uh, what will I get out of it sort of a thing. So these that was the first step that I took. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sam. And this has been extremely interesting. And thank you for sharing your thank experiences you. and your personal insights, um, being an archivist in a specific region in India. And um, it's just been wonderful to hear how, how, how generous members of the archival profession have been in supporting you in uh, your in your journey. And uh, I have a feeling that you'll be having influence uh, in assisting future generations of archivists. So thank you once again, and we'll look thank forward you. to seeing you again soon as we move into our last session. So this is uh, our closing session, as I mentioned, but it's one of great substance. We have a five person panel which consists of, of archive professionals from various countries with professional back, different professional backgrounds who've completed ICA's new professional program in recent years. So I would like to welcome Laura Uturbi More, Rebecca Adams, Susanna Tyndall, Saman Quareshi, and Randolph Ildebert Agli who will provide us with a global perspective on archival education as a pathway to practice. And I'll turn things over to our moderator, Lara. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. So thank you so much, Leslie. So hello everyone, my name is Laurito Ramori. I'm a new professional alumni from Peru in 2022. On this occasion, I have the opportunity to be the moderator of this talk with other new professional alumni. This talk is very important because my colleagues will mention their experience in the training in archives and record management. And they will also provide their advice and opinions of the subject. So to this end, a series of questions has been developed to share the information. So the first question will be, what is your educational professional background? How did you get into in the professional and how far in your career are you? Let's start with Rebecca. Hi everyone, um, I'm Rebecca Adams and I'm an archivist currently in the UK, um, Birmingham to be specific. Um, <clears throat> so I actually, um, so I've, I've been in the profession for around, this is my sixth year. Um, I graduated from the um, University College London uh, archive course in 2018. And since then I've been working at various or I've been working at, uh, I worked at the London Metropolitan Archives in London, and now I'm at the Canberra Research Library in Birmingham. Uh, and I've mostly done, uh, worked on project, um, archive projects, uh, mostly around uh, Black British history. Um, I got into the profession as, uh, during my undergrad, undergraduate at um, Goldsmiths University, London, uh, there was a module that was um, called History at Work, where uh, for um, four weeks you would be able to go to an archive or museum and uh, you would have like a little project that you would do around a specific area or a spe specific collection. And I ended up going to where I eventually worked at, where the London Metropolitan Archives. And I realised that there were a lot of archives that also reflected my own life and my own community. Um, as uh, my family are um, Afro-Caribbean um, and from Jamaica. And so that really made me realise that I could actually um, not only be a part of the archives, but also help the archives in various senses. 
So I eventually ended up um, finishing my um, undergrad and then moving into uh, my master's at the um, University College London in um, archives and records management. And from there, I, um, yeah, and, and I guess the, the rest is history. Um, so that was kind of how I really got into um, kind of being an archivist and kind of the archive, archive sector. Okay. And Susanna, what about you? Hi, everyone. Uh, so I um, started off with a Bachelor of Arts, uh, got to the end of that and went, I have absolutely no idea what to do with this degree, as most people I find do. Um, I took a year off and I was like, I'll work in retail and look for some volunteering positions and ended up at the public record office here in Melbourne, um, which has the collection for the state of Victoria. Um, loved it and thought I need to get a career out of this. So let's find what I can do. Um, found a course at Monash University, which was a one year graduate diploma. Um, I applied and was accepted in something ridiculous like six hours. Um, I think because it was a full fee paying course so they're like, excellent, we'll get some money out of this one. Um, and uh, so I did that course, was very fortunate to then get a position at Monash University as well. So I was with the records management team for um, about five and a half years and I recognized the, the records, our team was in eSolutions, which is the IT department for the university, but my IT skills were certainly lacking. So I reached out to our director and he, I got us a comment in the IT support team, which is called Service Desk. Um, and I was like, I'll stay there for a little while, but I've loved it so much that I've stayed on for a bit longer and I'm bringing those skills um, and my records management and archival skills in information broadly uh, to tickets that come through. So more of a specialist within the team, um, but definitely I'm excited to take the skills that I've learned from IT back into the profession again. Randall, can you tell us your story? Or can you summon? Randolph, you're on, you're on mute. Excuse me, excuse me. Yes. Oh, okay. Excuse me, excuse me. Don't worry, don't Hello, worry. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Randolph, uh, Randolph Idebe Ageko. I'm from Benin. Uh, actually, I live in France and uh, I'm in a uh, informational government consultant. I enter the profession by luck. On my father's recommendation, I knew nothing about the information and documentation profession when uh, I started training at university. Years later, I have a bachelor degree in archival science, which uh, I obtained in Benin. After my uh, after after my undergraduate study, I worked in uh, many financial companies in Benin, and also too far in uh, fundraising projects, notably for public figures. It was an enriching experience for me. In the course, in the course of this experience, I learned how to develop archival management and research tools. I also learning how to manage an archive project. I had the luck to pilot a number of archive organization projects. But, but, but these tasks were limited to paper archive. So I traveled to France to continue my study. In, uh, uh, I did a master's degree in uh, digital information engineering at uh, Jean Jaurès University. During this uh, training, I learned a lot of uh, IT language as the curve 
were more oriented towards web development. That is my experience. Okay, Randall. What about you, Saman? Hi, Laura. Uh, thank you. I uh, I would be here repeating myself, but uh, I have I'm, I'm trained as an architect and an architectural historian, and I uh, and Sept Archives is one of the first architectural archives that was set up in around ten years, and uh, I have as uh, as a young graduate in um uh, in uh, as a young history architectural history graduate i found it very interesting to have um and i was going there as a student and i found it very interesting to uh, uh, to see such kind of uh, uh, an institution for the first time and uh, since i we, we were working on a project that uh, that uh, that mandated us to go to the archives and work at the archives and look what the material is and what are the kind of things that the archives have and also the archives of the archives of the institution. Uh, so I think that piqued my interest. However, I did not join just then. I did a lot of other things, and then when the opportunity presented itself and when there was an opening, I did try my hand. Uh, I did try my luck, and I did get into the archives, and that is where this journey of archiving and being an archivist started. Okay. Well, after hearing your answers, I, I believe that we each have our own background, our own perspective, but I believe that that is something very common that we didn't have like a goal to be ar archivists, archivists, that it was something that we met in in our career, we, we were finding something. Um, yeah, we became, we, we started to love this career, right? But it was not something that we choose from the beginning. I think it's something that we each have in common. So the second question would be, are the pathways into the professional in the country widely accessible to the people from all backgrounds and socioeconomic circumstances? If not, what will help improve accessibility? Tell us. Sorry, did you say Saman? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. My bad then. Um, no, no thank you, Laura, for this question. Uh, I think this uh, the issue of accessibility uh, from different uh, from different to sort of larger audience is always a question and always something that we uh, keep on uh, sort of uh, working at. Uh, at this point, the idea of creating more awareness as to what archives do and why they are important is one way to uh, increase more you know, reach and accessibility to the archive itself. And also allow, uh, because I work at a very specialized archive, which is focusing on a certain kind of material, but that material is uh, also related to a larger socioeconomic um, factor of the built environment. Built, we are all part of the built environment. We all uh, uh, live, in, uh, live in spaces that are designed by architects and so on. Um, and so there are avenues that we are trying to create through public programming that allows us to sort of create more accessibility to the material that we have at the archives. Uh, apart from then, uh, the more technical issues is of description. And we have also realized that describing material in a more uh, easy manner that is also understandable by somebody who's not an architect, who's not an historian, uh, also allows for a wider discoverability and uh, wider accessibility. So these are the things that we've been sort of trying at, uh, trying at my workplace to be able to allow wider accessibility. And public programming is a very, uh, uh, we've had very good engagements with uh, different kind of public programs that includes in, uh, inviting uh, different kind of scholars and not only very specific uh, domain scholars to the archives and talking about uh, these archives as sites of scholarship, archives as sites of uh, uh, what are the different kind of things that the archives can offer. And somebody was recently talking about how um, archival documentaries are made. So there are wide uh, varieties of things that people have done with the archives. And this kind of uh, discussions and engagement creates a, uh, creates a much wider uh, understanding and um, accessibility to people that they are not only for one use, they're not only for the use by researchers. There are multiple uses of the archive that one can look at. 
I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yes, definitely. What about you, Rebecca? Um, well, to, to answer the question, I think, um, especially in the UK, when it comes to the heritage sector, um, it can be quite difficult for, um, it's, it's not necessarily accessible to large numbers of people, um, depend, especially as, uh, the sector is quite, um, underfunded and there's also, um, a lot of issues when it comes to a lot of people have to, um fund the different courses themselves for example they also have to um volunteering is usually free uh, it's not a, a kind of a, obviously it's, it's usually not paid so it means that unless you have the uh the financial uh, means to be able to take time out time out of your um day or time out to be able to um volunteer in various places and also be on various courses to become an archivist it can be very difficult um especially if you're from uh if, if you're from an, a low income family for example um i i definitely think that to be able to make um archives and becoming an archivist more accessible I think there would probably need to be uh, more funding um, uh, placed into um, the sector as a whole. Um, I also think uh, that uh, apprenticeships would also be um, very beneficial for a lot of people rather than having to go, go through higher education um, as not everyone um, has the means to be able to afford it and also just generally the time. Um, and also I think for a lot of um new newly um new archivists um and records managers but i think specifically archivists it can be quite difficult to find um work that is higher paid but also permanent um a lot of uh the the jobs are usually project based they're usually for a certain period of time which can be quite difficult if if an, if somebody wants uh uh financial stability for example so i think um there there are quite a lot of um, obstacles in the way if you want to become an archivist um in the uk um and i think there could potentially be more uh more incentive in various areas to be able to allow more people to kind of um think of becoming an archivist as a as a as a viable future i think Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, probably reiterating a lot of what Rebecca said. Um, as I said earlier, the course that I did was very much a financial commitment. Um, so in Australia, <coughs> graduate diplomas, because they're only a one year course, aren't applicable for international students. So there's no co um, government support for those courses. Um, so it was yeah, very much a financial decision to go into that one. Um, I was very fortunate when I, because I forgot to mention before, I did go into finish a, a master's um, because that's a, a larger course. I was able to get government funding to do that. Um, I was thinking as well about Re Rebecca said, obviously was doing volunteering, but while I was still working in another position, as part of my graduate diploma, we had to do a three week um, placement. That was by far my favourite part of the entire course. But once again, you're not being paid for three weeks. I My other job, because it was um, uh, during the same hours, I didn't get paid, but luckily I could get some government funding. So pretty much covered my rent for that time, but that was about it. Um, it's very much, a, yeah, going in and going. It's probably going to be financially hard for a little while, but probably okay in the long run um, and yeah probably same as Rebecca those short-term projects I was very fortunate that I went into an ongoing role so it kind of kept going through um, but yeah uh, knowing how few roles there are available and how hard it is to get one of those roles um, when I was looking to go in someone said to me some of the positions it's very much you have to wait for someone to retire or pass away until their role will come up again because if they get one that's going they will stay there and just keep going and going and going that i think worth all the hardship of those times being a poor student to be where i am now 
Okay, half project. <laughs> uh, Randolph, can you tell us? Randolph? It has to be said uh, access to a CAD training school in Benin is uh, highly selective and the cost of training is very, very expensive. At around 650 euros, it has to be said access to archive training school in Benin is highly selective and the cost of training is expensive. At around 650 euros, given that the minimum average in Benin is less than 100 euros, many parents don't have many parents don't have the way to finance their children's education. In fact, in fact, Benin has only one school offering training, training in archival science. <clears throat> Many people are already on a way of importance of a university education to manage archives. So it would be very important to make access easy. This would make it possible that the other training school to be set up and uh, for the government to reduce training costs. Okay. Thank you, Randall. So what I can hear is that we each have our similar parts also because here in Peru, we also have like one university that teaches um, archival and record management. So the remote areas cannot afford this type of information or this type of training. And also the jobs are not well paid and sometimes it's very difficult to find a job because um, they want people to have a lot of experience and and it's difficult in the part, no? Because you have to you have to get some volunteer job without pay and you have to continue paying your other things. So the next question is, is what are the pros and cons of apprenticeship and on the job training compared to the higher education? Vandal? Can you tell us, Vandal? Uh, in Mini, uh, the profession is still informal. And uh, many people who manage archives in company have no specific training in arch archiving. They are usually people who have been sent to the archive to punish them, or people who have, who have uh, training by the state. But I think it would always be better to have a degree in archive, archival science. Because archive management involves handling sensitive data. What's more, it requires precise technical skills. A person who manages an institution archive must have a perfect knowledge of the standard governance, the site, and uh, know how to apply them for the preservation and uh, proper combination of information. Okay. 
Someone, can you tell us? The most important uh, aspect becomes the finances uh, for people who are uh, uh, who cannot afford to be uh, to have enrolled themselves in in a degree. Uh, uh, for them, the on job trainings becomes very important, and often uh, and in in geographies like mine, uh, often those degrees and often those training programs are not very uh, uh, readily available or even if they are uh, you have to relocate and there's a lot of other financial aspects that come into picture uh, and also the economic realities of the geography that I'm based in does not allow one to do a lot of volunteer work at the moment. Um, given all of that there is definitely an advantage of having to do uh, having the employers to help you train on the job or uh, uh, you know um, um, uh, support them in professional development opportunities and find professional development opportunities for them. Um, yeah, I I don't see a disadvantage. I there, there is a disadvantage in terms of there's a longer learning curve that uh, that happens while you are while you're learning on the job as opposed to that you already know while you were doing um, your classes. So I think that's one of the disadvantages that I can see that the learning curve becomes a little longer. What about you, Susanna? So I obviously did um, that one year course before I went in and I would still say that I started my job having absolutely no idea what I was doing or what was going on. So obviously we learn a lot about the theories of um, uh, archival management. Uh, shout out to, um, oh my goodness, I've had a complete blank of the name of the theory, records continuum theory um, from Monash. So they said if you understood that before working in the profession, you didn't actually understand it. Um, so yeah, very much went in not knowing anything. And I think you do need that combination of probably theory-based training and definitely on-the-job training. Um, I think there's, as I said earlier, we did a three-week um, placement. And that kind of started to cement a lot of the information we had learnt. So I think that you do learn a lot more once you've actually started in the role. And I'm now seven years in and there's, you go back and think about some of the things you learnt and go, everything makes so much more sense now. Um, so I think definitely um, having those opportunities. And if they brought back things like cadetships and apprenticeships, I would be just plugging that to everyone. They're such a good idea. Yes, definitely. Rebecca, can you tell us? I think I'll probably end up mirroring a lot of what Susanna and Saman and Randolph said, really. Um, but I think I thought, so I don't end up repeating, repeating what everyone else said, maybe think, um, think of a different perspective in terms of, I think that um, doing the course can, and actually go, doing the degree um, in archives and records management can be quite beneficial if you if if you have an idea or if you know that potentially that you want to go continue into higher education so for example if you want to continue thinking about archival archival theory archival practice and you you know you, you want to think about it in a more um uh in in, in a way in terms of more research um, journal, write, you know, writing journal articles, writing about archival practice and writing about the the practice of being an archivist or records manager, I think it can be quite beneficial. As Susanna said, you end up learning a lot a lot about theory and you don't necessarily re really end up learning more about the practical side. So like Susanna, I basically went into my first role and thought, okay, I'm going to learn the job because I think being an archivist is very much a learn the job and I think it it's it's that it's the kind of job where it's beneficial for you to actually go in go in go into like you know an office or an archive or wherever it is and actually just try your best at the beginning really <laughs> um so I think um I think I do agree with Susanna in terms of I think both sides are beneficial but I also think it depends on where you feel where you see yourself in in a certain amount of years um because I know uh, when I was doing the course at UCL, we wrote out a five-year plan of where we wanted to be um, in five years. Uh, and I'm sure if you were writing, you know, I want to I want to, 
be more of a lecturer I want to kind of help mentor people or I want to kind of write more about theory or digital archives being on the course would be very beneficial for that but if you knew that you were going to work more with communities and community archives the practical side and actually doing an apprenticeship or um on the job training would and therefore you know volunteering and, and internships would probably be a better idea for you so I think it definitely depends on the individual I think um kind of what they what they want to do and what they plan to do yes of course they both side need to be work together uh well thanks everyone for coming it was a very interesting talk unfortunately we couldn't answer all the questions but it was a very interesting share of experience we each have a lot of um, wait just a moment please We have a lot of comments too. So our background may be different because you are from the UK, another is the Susana is from Australia and from Peru. But we have very similarities in our, our training opportunities also. I, I was I was seeing that. So yeah. So I I will I would like to talk to bring Leslie. Thank you so much, Lara, and thank you, everybody. This was incredible hearing some of your experiences. Now, we do have time for one more question each. So I've got a question for you, but it's a real challenge. So I'm launching a challenge to you. I'm going, you know, kind of off script. So prepare yourselves. I'd like you each, and I'll call on you one by one, to tell us in one minute what the most impactful thing for you was about having done the new professionals program and share that because I think our, our participants would be very interesting having heard something about your journey into archive becoming an archivist, but I think they'd be very interested in knowing what kind of experience you had, but we're limited in time. So I'm launching that challenge with you that you try to keep it close to a minute and we've, we've got a little bit of room to maneuver, but not too much. And I'm gonna go first, let's see, I'm spinning the wheel over to Susanna. I think the best part about it was finding out there's so many people there that are like me. So yeah, the opportunity to go to Rome and I think there were 800 people at that conference and just the experiences of people from all over the world um, that I think that was by far the most amazing part. And then just the fact that those conversations keep going and keep interacting with people and having great experiences. Now you're efficient. You were like at 27 seconds um, and I knew you looked familiar. I think I saw you in Rome. And that was incredible too, because that was actually my first ICA. So we share an experience there. All right, now we'll go over to Rebecca. So Rebecca, how about you? I because um I, I went to the uh the conference in Abu Dhabi. Um and I would say the most impactful was probably um the connections I made with people. Um being at an international conference actually meant that you could actually meet people from so many different parts of the world that you might not actually have come across um, in, you know, in your everyday life. So, for example, I was really interested in meeting archivists from the Caribbean um, as that was something that was really important to me and also you know, part of my heritage. So being able to do that and actually um, see the different experiences, I think that was kind of one of the one of the highlights for me, I think. And I was really happy that I was able to do that um, as part of the new professional program. Yeah, so it seems for both of you, the opportunity to attend the Congress was, was a real highlight. Um, so we'll see in terms of others. Uh, Saman, how about you? What, what, what was a highlight for you? 
Well, Congress, of course, was one of the highlight of meeting people and connecting with people, but most importantly, to represent it, to uh, get a platform to speak and provide uh, and and uh, share the, the experience of the work that one does. It's something very important to the community that is so big, so helpful, was such a, you always knew that there are people uh, dealing with the same problems, but the tangibility, the tactility of actually realizing and seeing all those people in person uh, in uh, during the Congress, during the Abu Dhabi Congress was very uh, um, humbling, was very overwhelming and as well, very, uh, a very happy moment that you realize that there's so many people to connect to. Uh, so I think that remains and the, the platform that it cre uh, provides and, uh, you know, people get to know your work, you get to know people's work and and then you forge connections for life, you forge uh, friendships for life, you forge your colleagues and peers for life and they're, they're just there, uh, uh, one email away, one call away, one message away and that's what that's what the profession as I talked earlier uh, it was just very real. It was one always knew that this was the profession, but when you actually attend the congress, the the entire uh, the gathering, the the oneness of the profession, actually you see it, you feel it, and that's what was the uh, the highlight and the platform that it allows uh, for you to see the world and for the world to see you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, Randolph. <clears throat> Uh, I'm likely to spot the other the program has enabled me to learn a lot, a lot of, especially from my mentor, and uh, to learn from the from the other people in the program. It uh, allowed it allowed me to meet uh, a lot of people, especially people I've been in contact with for years. Thanks for the program. I have new perspective for the field, particularly in Africa. Africa. Yes, so it was great that you made connections, you built your network, and and you got to be able to meet in person because I think each of you had a mentor, and mentors are very important to us all. Uh, I've certainly had key mentors in 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 my career. And um, and once someone's part of your network, hopefully they're always part of your network and someone that you can work together with. And, uh, you know, sometimes you need advice and it's good to have people that you can go to for that. Now, uh, Lara, how about you? Uh, I also went to Rome. I am from the same cohort with Isana. Uh, well, obviously I met a lot of people it was a good, uh, very nice experience, but I was very happy to meet um, one person in particular, was Stenjan Boada, because he was my conference body, and I was talking to him about some books, and I didn't realize he was the editor, and then he told me, and I was like, oh my God, and then he they gave me a book signing, and so that, that's, my, that's my memory, that's my share. Well, that's that's a great experience, and and it must have been it must have been so um, so impactful for 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 him to 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 know that you appreciated his work and hadn't put the two together. I didn't realize he was. I was talking just. I I so really like enjoyed his book. Yeah, he was actually like famous, and you didn't realize. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, I like. I would like to work. It was his book, but I can't afford it. I was like, it is, you should have told me as early. I I will give you all my books. And I was, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it sounds like each of you had an incredible experience in your journeys to become archivists and in your experience with the New Professionals Program. And I think we've had a great session Sadly enough, we're running out of time. I can't believe we've almost hit two hours together. It seems like it went by, time went by very, very quickly. So I really want to thank our new professional alumni for this incredible panel. And thank you so much for sharing your experience. And now I think I'll just say a few remarks in terms of uh, closing our, our session for, for today. But uh, so we've, we've heard from our last panel,
huge thank you to our moderator, uh, Laura. She did a wonderful job. And I think we should give a warm round of a virtual applause to all of our presenters who've done just a, an incredible job today. Um, I would like to do a quick recap of the seminar, which was of course dedicated to exploring archival education and training um, and research. We uh, heard from Pilar, she spoke about significant professional contributions of people with disabilities in archives and how we can support and facilitate access to services without ignorance or prejudice. And my colleagues, Brittany and Lara and Lydia spoke about the interdisciplinary nature of their roles and the varied backgrounds that archivists at Libraries and Archive Canada come from. Salman highlighted the experience of being an untrained archivist, although trained as, a, as a, uh, an architect, and discussed the pros and cons of learning on the job. And then we had our fabulous panel of our new professionals uh, alumni reflecting on the different pathways available globally to practice and train in archival work. So I think we can all agree that they've all provided us with eye-opening and very instructive discussions. Each one of them has, I think, mentioned that they'd be happy for you to reach out to them if you'd like to have a private conversation. And for those that would like to revisit these presentations, a recording will be made available on ICA's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. I do wanna thank our organizers, the ICA New Professionals Program one more time. What an incredible, impactful program. So many great people working for the future of our profession. It is so essential for all of us to participate in these kind of events and be able to understand the value and the impact that they have. So I hope that you were all reminded about the scope and, and, and the impact um, that, this, that this field has such an important um, impact on, on our heritage. And uh, it's no secret that um, this profession and the way we work, uh, they're both in constant evolution. We cannot predict with absolute certainty which way technology and societal context and world events will take our work as archivists. But through collaboration, working closely in networks, leveraging programs like this, and working within important associations like the International Council of Archives, we can stay ahead of these sweeping changes and address the challenges to come. We need to maintain an open line of communication and make sure that we're uh, engaging in knowledge exchange. And we need to cultivate relationships and welcome broad and diverse perspectives in our profession. So I'd like to encourage all the new professionals and students that are listening to take part in as many learning and networking opportunities as you can. Even though you may not see clearly in the early stages of your careers, your contributions to the field are invaluable. Do not hesitate to make yourselves heard and ask for the support you need. We've heard from our speakers today how generous members of the profession are in sharing their advice, their knowledge, and their expertise. You can, your input can often provide a different viewpoint to more experienced professionals. Your energy can rejuvenate and you can serve as motivation for us to improve our services and support those who are using our archives. Thank you once again to the presenters for the insightful contributions. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for my dear colleagues at Libraries and Archives Canada for all the technical support, for working closely with all of us that presented today. You're a fabulous gang, love working with you. And do keep an eye out for upcoming events organized by the NPP, including more of the virtual seminar series later this year. I wish you a great rest of your day. A bientôt. Miigwech. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, everyone.